Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the CTE Technical Assistance Center of New York. A few technical points to cover before we begin. All attendees are on mute during the webinar and the presentation today will be approximately one hour. Questions will be addressed via email upon completion of today's webinar. To submit a question during the webinar, type it into the questions pane on your control panel. You may also email questions to ctetac at spnet.us. If you are disconnected and cannot reconnect independently, please call 518-723-2137. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the CTE Technical Assistance Center website at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. From here, you will also be able to access today's PowerPoint presentation as well as the recorded webinar. If you have any questions or suggestions regarding upcoming webinars, please contact the Technical Assistance Center at ctetac at spnet.us. Hi, my name is Ginny Lee. I'm so glad that you could join us here today for this webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about some of the implications and then some practical applications of the New York State um, P through 12 Common Core Learning Standards for Mathematics. We will be having some opportunities for you to participate in today's webinar, so be ready for that as we call for you to generate some ideas and um, uh, uh, solutions. So today's agenda for the webinar, we're going to look at some background and an overview of the development of the New York State Common Core Learning Standards. And we'll also look at that in light of the rigor and relevance framework. We'll look at shifts in mathematics instruction. Um, it's changing, and it has changed quite a bit since some of us were in school, so we'll talk about that. And then we're going to do some application, planning and delivering math instruction based on the standards for mathematical practice. We'll talk about what it means to do math. And finally, we'll wrap up with some resourceful websites where you can go for uh, more information. As we begin, I'd like to have you write down four or five verbs that describe what occurs as part of a traditional math classroom. Um, you can type your verbs in the comment box and send them in to me. Just take you know, 10 or 15 seconds. Um, I told you there would be participation. Here, here we're starting right off the bat. So if you could just send some um, ideas, you know, uh, what, what is done in a traditional classroom. Um, the first one that comes to my mind, very common, is memorize. There's a lot of memorizing in my math classes growing up. Um, so, you could send, we have no participants yet, come on. All right, well, um, I'll get us going with a few here, um, verbs that describe more traditional math classes, things that you would do, add, or practice. A lot of practicing. I don't know about you, but I had a lot of worksheets in math class as I was coming along. Um, memorizing, reciting. Um, these are the type of verbs that typically would describe a math class in the traditional, in the traditional way of teaching. And we're going to talk about how that's changing. Um, but first, we're going to look at some of the background on the Common Core State Standards. Um, The Common Core State Standards Initiative was a state-led effort. Um, a lot of people think this was a, um, a government-led, um, handed down from above. Um, the press has kind of um, negatively portrayed this, and um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. But it was actually um, begun um, at a state level. The National Governors Association Center for Best Practices um, the NGA, and the Council of Chief State School Officers. So um, it, was, it was used to write the standards that were informed by the best of state standards. They were informed by experienced teachers, um, content experts, 
states and leading thinkers, and also feedback from the general public. Um, to write the standards, they brought together all of these experts, and the standards have since been divided into two categories. There's the college and career readiness standards, which address what students are expected to learn when they to have learned once they have graduated from high school, and then the K-12 standards, which address the expectations um, for within elementary through high school. So um, during the public comment period, it's important to know that, that the um, NGA Center and the CCSS all received nearly 10,000 comments um, from the public comment period. There were two different public comment periods. Um, the Common Core mathematical standards are based on what have been deemed important processes and proficiencies and many, many years of research. Um, among these other things, there were two really important collaborative documents that informed the math section of these standards. And one was the NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics Principal and Standards for School Mathematics. And the other was the Adding It Up report. Um, it's really important to emphasize that these were also developed as a under a consensus process. They were based on real research. Many, many classroom teachers were involved in the process, as were mathematicians and educational researchers. Um, the principles and standards for school mathematics um, look at these principles of problem solving, reasoning, communication, connections, and representation. Um, there's also six principles of equity, curriculum, teaching, learning, assessment, and technology that describe their recommended framework for mathematics. And then um, the other, the other um, report that contributed significantly to the development of the New York State Common Core standards was um, adding it up, um, adding it up Mathematical proficiency strands um, are adaptive reasoning, strategic competence, conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and productive disposition. Um, now that the second document was published by the National Research Council um, here, this, this second document is um, from the National Academy of Sciences. and. Um, the strands of mathematical proficiency that are highlighted in that report are, are these here. So um, you can purchase a print or electronic version of that book. Um, it, it's, it's a useful resource. So that brings us to the Common Core State Standards for Mathematical Practice, um, and specifically to the mathematical portion of the Common Core State Standards um, we're going to look at these eight overall standards, and then we'll talk a little bit about each one. Um, they're written from the perspective of mathematically proficient students. So it's, it's coming at this from what do mathematically proficient students do, and how can we then um, use that to inform instruction. I think that you'll see recognize some of the elements of the um, NCTM standards that we just looked at, as well as the adding up proficiency strands. These can also be found, um, obviously, on the website. So um, these are making sense of problems and persevering in doing them, reasoning abstractly and quantitatively, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, model with mathematics, use appropriate tools strategically, attend to precision, look for and make use of structure, and look for and express, express regularity and repeated reasoning. So before we move on, I think it's important, and some of you may have already seen this um, in looking at this, these verbs are very different than what we traditionally think of in a mathematics classroom. Um, we have make and persevere, reason, construct, critique, model, um, use, attend, look, express. So we have some really different verbs entering into this. And, and that's, a telling, that's a telling sign. Um, 
no longer is math just about computing and doing procedures. Uh, these standards demand a much deeper level of thought from students and consequently from you, their teachers, a much deeper level of thought. This may be a, a struggle for some teachers who've never been pressed to think beyond the procedures themselves. I know it was a shift for me when I first became um, aware of the changes. So the implications for the teachers are significant, but so are the implications for their students. Now, a lot of people say, well, Common Core means that they don't need to know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, which is just not true. Um, again, I think there's been some media that has highlighted um, different aspects of this and, and made this um, made this into um, some some public fears. But um, the Common Core state standards really are um, concerned with procedural and conceptual knowledge. Uh, but it is important to realize that if we just focus on procedures the way that mathematics classrooms did in the past. Um, that's the equivalent of just focusing on phonics and literacy instruction. I mean, the analogy isn't perfect, but you get the idea that if you're just doing procedures, um, you're, you're not really understanding what's happening and it becomes much more difficult to then apply those um, procedures or that knowledge in a real world setting. Um, so we're really in the Common Core State Standards much more about thinking more deeply about mathematics and um, understanding the concepts, not just the procedures. Um, and actually, I think this is one of the places where CTE has quite an advantage, because by the very nature of integrating mathematics into real world settings, this connection is being made in CTE, because CTE is so um, real world based. You're, you're, you're looking at um, actual occupations and actual um, real life situation. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. So as we begin to look for ways to apply all this, we need to look at our verbs and ultimately at our mathematics instruction, our tasks, and our assessments. But all of that in terms of this rigor and relevance framework. Um, you can see going up the, the left-hand side of this that um, there's this knowledge taxonomy, you know, where we start with sort of basic knowledge and awareness and go through comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. So we can see that we're becoming um, much more applied and much more evaluative as we move up that taxonomy. And then if you look along the bottom, you can see the um, International Center for Leadership and Education application model, which describes the ways that knowledge is applied and utilized. So knowledge in one discipline, then applied in the discipline, applied across disciplines, applied to real world predictable situations, and then applied to real world unpredictable situations. So um, then these different quadrants are where those intersect. Um, so you can see um, that, that we're moving more in a direction that's going to enable students to be um, better equipped to apply um, to real world situations, which is ultimately the goal of education. So if we revisit the verbs from the beginning, where um, you were asked to think about verbs that describe a traditional mathematics classroom, um, think about what quadrant those verbs would fall in. Um, they're not they're not up there if you think about memorize and um, add and, and those kinds of things. You won't see those up there in those quadrants, C's and D's. You're, you're going to be down here more in this acquisition um, quadrant here, quadrant A. But if we look for the verbs in the standards for mathematical practice and where those fall, um, you can see that um, we're now moving in a direction that's much more positive. Um, here's an example from just one, one page of the um, high school common core state standards. And you can see words that are um, verbs that are pretty different from those traditional ones. So we have things like um, understand and make inferences and 
decide. I didn't get to decide much in my mathematical class, my math classes growing up. So um, this is this is kind of you know thinking on a different level. So they're deciding. Um, they are evaluating reports. You can see using data. Um, so and explaining things. So um, this, we're moving up into these verbs, and here's, here's a better one um, with those quadrants that actually have some of those verbs. And we're moving up into that quadrant um, where we're looking at, uh, or these quadrants where we're looking at analyzing and evaluating, and then um, you know, leading up into things like uh, formulating and planning and predicting. So. Um, these are great verbs to keep in mind when you're planning lessons um, and you're writing problems for your students to solve because um, these verbs will help you keep them in um, out of this just calculate, count, define, which is where so much of um, math education tends to take place and move out into these, um, these other quadrants where they can justify and um, judge and compare and discover and um, uh, propose. So, so these are really these are really um, helpful verbs, and you'll have all that as a um, when you have the the backup of this. So, so um, but to dispel the myth that Common Core um, dispenses of um, any concern with procedural skills. It, it's just not true. It's right in the Common Core. This is straight from their website that um, it is um, an important thing to have skill in carrying out procedures flexibly, accurately, efficiently, and appropriately. So um, these, these skills and these uh, procedural skills and the concepts are both important. So they're, they're side by side and they're actually even more interwoven than that, um, both procedural and conceptual uh, understanding is going to be really key. So we, for some of us, we're moving away from purely procedural, but that doesn't mean that we're moving away from procedural. And that's really important to recognize. Um, these are just some examples straight, again, from the standards themselves, you know, where students are expected to fluently add and subtract. Um, and you can see that, you know, they're using place value understanding and properties of operations to add and subtract. So this is straight from um, a younger a younger level, but it, it's all across the levels. Um, and so the value of, of procedural fluency is built into these standards, just not in isolation. So as you can see, this is not just new math that we're talking about. And I hope that that's um, really what you take away from this part of it, is that these standards are not intended to be names for just an old way of doing, new names for just an old way of doing business. And this is, you know, this is what they say, you know, right in the standards themselves. They're called to take the next step. This is to help um, students be better at, um, understanding what's really going on in the math. So what are the implications? What are the implications for the students, but also for you as their teachers? Um, well, first off, students and you as their teachers are going to need to have a really deep conceptual knowledge of math concepts. Um, not only what a procedure is to do something, but why that particular procedure works. So. Um, it isn't going to be enough to know that to figure out one half divided by one fourth, you would just flip and multiply. You as teachers will need to understand why does that procedure work? What does it look like? How could you draw a picture of it? Um, what are other ways that that problem could be solved? <clears throat> um, so you also, your students are going to need to be able to effectively communicate their mathematical understandings and discuss them with you as their teacher and with their peers. And you as a teacher will also need to be able to effectively discuss these things because you're going to see that students are going to have multiple ways of solving these problems. And 
um, your understanding has to be deep enough to be able to accommodate all these different approaches and, and to evaluate, is this accurate? Is this going to work all the time? Or what is a leading question I can ask to my student to help um, deepen their knowledge or get them back on track in their thinking? So your knowledge is going to need to be deep enough that you can effectively communicate um, these ideas. And then also, students and you as their teachers are going to need opportunities to demonstrate their ability to apply math understanding to new and real life situations. So um, ditto sheets, worksheets, and textbooks um, are not always going to meet this need. You as their teachers are going to need to look for ways to um, write and apply um, problems. Now, there are some textbooks that do um, have a movement towards this. There are some very good um, places to find some problems. But it, you know, when, in CTE, it's going to be really relevant problems that are going to motivate students to apply math and use math and see the need for math. So um, this is going to be important for you, a skill for you to develop as well. So there are many languages of math. It's not just equations and numbers. It's not just graphs and tables. But pictures are important, um, drawing and demonstrating models, building models, using models to, um, to solve problems, and um, moving objects and manipulating things also. These will all also help um, as, you, as you work through mathematics lessons. So, so consider all of these languages of math, um, not just numbers, when you're, when you're planning and delivering instruction. So what are the implications for planning mathematical instruction, and how are we going to apply this to specific lessons? That's really the crux of what we need to, um, to look at here. Um, engage New York, the research, um, and achieve the core.org. These, these are the instructional shifts that we need to be making in mathematics, and that there are specific results um, of these common core state standards. Uh, the first one is focus. Um, we need to shift our focus to foundational knowledge and a really deep understanding. Um, we need to, to shift, second of all, in coherence. So connect learning within and across grades, building new understanding onto foundations from previous years. Um, and each standard is an extension of previous learning. We we'll also look at fluency. Um, we talked about that procedural fluency, that, that students would be fluent, that they would have a deep understanding, that they'd be able to apply the mathematics. And that, again, goes back to that rigor relevant framework where we were looking at the application to real world settings. Um, that's, that's key. That's where we're going. And that, that we also have a dual intensity where we're looking at, um, at this from both procedural and conceptual. So, your instruction really needs to be informed by these learning standards, but it also should be informed by research-based practices, which the standards are also informed by. It's really key to remember that your instruction should be informed by student performance data, that you keep um, daily records of what your students understand, where they're going, and um, that you plan accordingly and that they are informed by that rigor relevance framework so that you are moving them towards being able to utilize what you're teaching them in the real world, um, that you're teaching them skills not just of memorizing and of repeating back, but of applying and evaluating and, um, and using this in settings that can be um, useful. So this is um, a quote from Van de Waal. He wrote um, a lot about uh, mathematics education. Um, and his, 
his uh, quote about doing math, I think, is just really applicable right here. Mathematics is more than completing sets of exercises or mimicking processes the teacher explains. Doing mathematics means generating strategies for solving problems, applying those approaches, seeing if they lead to solutions, and checking to see if your answers make sense. Doing mathematics in classrooms should closely model the act of doing mathematics in the real world. And I think um, the implications are really significant here, that if we're going to closely model the act of doing mathematics in the real world, again, CTE is well on the way here since this is the premise on which it's built, um, preparing for real world application. So um, at this point, I want to um, have us look at some specific examples that do apply to CTE um, setting. And I'm going to have you solve some problems and generate some ideas. So um, be ready to participate um, in this next section where we're, we're going to be looking. Because you'll have ideas. Um, it, 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 this is really much more interesting when there is participation because um, everyone has a different slightly different way of approaching a problem. And it, it's much more interesting when there's sharing involved. So if you um, type in how you would solve a particular problem, then I can share that with the group. And, um, and, and that'll benefit um, multiple people. So, um, this first example for embedding math in a CTE classroom is um, from architecture and construction. The math that it deals with is uh, geometry and measurement in the Pythagorean theorem. So here's the problem. While working on one of the rooms of a house, Taylor is building the walls for one of the bedrooms. Two of the walls are 8 and a half feet tall and 13 and a half feet long. And two of the walls are 8 and a half feet tall and 16 feet long. How can Taylor use the Pythagorean theorem to ensure that the corners of the walls are square? Any suggestions? I'll give you guys a minute to type that in. So, so far I don't see anybody, but I, I want to also um, give you the chance to think about what are some advantages of this type of a problem versus a worksheet or a typical textbook problem. Um, think about the verbs that we talked about, the application um, quadrant of the, of the rigor relevance framework, and think about um, the kind of application that this requires um, of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it's really different if you think about it than a question where, um, you know, someone just says, um, if one leg is eight and a half inches and the other is 13 and a half inches, what's a hypotenuse? I, this is, that's a really different question than what this is asking. And for a student that is in construction and and wanting to, uh, you know, become better at building houses, th this has got real relevance and real application. So um, this is a way to apply the Pythagorean theorem um, in, a, in a much more meaningful way. And, and this is a lesson that can be extended um, to include measurement and ratios and proportions. So, um, and also to give a learner who may um, learn better by doing an opportunity to, to build something and to make something. So here's an extension for that. Um, in the room that Taylor built, there are three doors, each measuring two and a half feet by six and a half feet, and two windows, each measuring three by five. So now you're going to give students an opportunity to build using heavy duty cardboard, a model, small enough to fit on their desk, or you'll never have room in your classroom, um, of that room. So 
you'll say to students, you know, make your model to scale using these dimensions. You can put the doors and windows wherever you choose within the room, logically, of course. And then, along with your model, you should include the key for your scale dimension and a written explanation of how you determine that, that scale. So um, now you, you can see we've extended into a different way of showing knowledge. We're not just writing down what we know. We're building something. Um, we're doing quite a few calculations here. Um, we're having to understand not only measurement, but ratios and proportions in order to make those scales. So it's just um, a, a much more embedded um, real life application mathematical problem. So here is another one that we're going to look at. This one is um, embedding um, the math in an agricultural food and natural resource arena using percent. This one is regarding um, agriculture. Steve's farm has 75 acres of land. His plan is to plant corn on 60% of the land. How many acres will he plant with corn? So um, we have a real life application of um, calculating percent. But um, and this, yeah, this could be a word problem in a textbook. But um, the extension on this requires more. It requires research, reasoning, problem solving, and the numbers and operations aspect. So here you can have students work in groups to use the internet to research the answers to these questions. How much corn seed will Steve need to purchase in order to plant corn on 60% of his land? And what will be the cost of that seed? And how much corn will this amount of seed yield? Now, this is going to be an ongoing um, project that will take some time. And you know, planning accordingly will be important. But you can see that um, now we've taken a math lesson. And we've uh, oh, I've lost my screen here. Sorry. We've uh, applied it in a, in a real world. Setting. And, and now they have to go out and generate information, um, or obtain information, and then generate responses based on that. So this is quite different, as you can see, from a textbook or a worksheet. Um, and of course, it will be important for them to cite their sources for information and include any calculations that they made so that you can, in fact, um, really um, hone in on that. So. So for another example, we have the hospitality and the tourism. Um, we can look at a restaurant's recipe for rice. And again, we'll do some proportions, but also introduce fractions. Um, this one is based on a recipe for rice that calls for 16 and a half cups of water. 8 and a fourth cups of rice. But Sam only has 6 cups of rice left, so how much water should he use? Now he's got to use proportions to figure this out. Again, um, if you want to send in possible ways, students wouldn't necessarily have to have been exposed to proportions to solve this. There's multiple ways of um, coming at this problem. I've seen it solved with um, just pictures, and uh, you could use pictures to understand this relationship of um, rice to water or water to rice. So um, if you want to send in your solution or your way that you might solve this um, or ways that you think students might solve it, those are always interesting to share. In terms of an ex 
extension for this, students can make a poster um, using the proportions and fractions. So some days are much busier in the restaurant, so extra rice is needed. Other days are less busy, so less rice is needed. So make a poster for the restaurant kitchen wall showing the recipe for five different quantities of rice and the corresponding amount of water needed. So here again, we have a different way of demonstrating knowledge. It's a very practical and useful way that can actually be on the wall of the kitchen. Um, and it could be adapted to whatever recipe you want, but this is a um, way that students will have to see what proportions mean and how they apply to different recipes and different quantities. Um, so again, if you look back over these, you can see um, all of the elements of this, uh, of these different aspects of the New York State Common Core Learning Standards. You can see um, there's making sense of problems. Uh, students will be expected to persevere in solving them. Some of these are lengthy extensions that will take some time. Students will reason abstractly and quantitatively, so they will have to think um, without concrete objects when they're doing just the numbers, but with concrete objects, um, they'll have to, to uh, reason quantitatively because there are calculations involved in all of these cases. Um, again, these are back to those, those eight um, principles um, from the, the learning standards. An important aspect, too, is to incorporate discussion so that students will construct arguments. They'll also be able to critique the reasoning of others so that um, without having discussion, students don't have those opportunities. So this, is, this may be something a bit different than a traditional mathematics classroom where students are expected to share the results, share their solutions, share their processes for getting to those solutions um, so that they can um, learn from each other and uh, strengthen their own knowledge by um, justifying and defending their solutions. Um, they'll model with mathematics. They'll use appropriate tools strategically. You can see elements of all of these in these different um, problems that have been presented here. They'll look for and make use of structure within problems. Um, proportions are a great example of that, where you can see, um, you know, eight. 16 and a half is to 8 and a quarter as 6 is to what? Um, also to look for and express regularity and repeated reasoning so that they continue to build on um, the reasoning from one problem to the next or from one aspect of a problem to the next aspect. <clears throat> So I want you to take some time here and reflect on, um, on uh, the, the way that these tasks are different from completing math worksheets and textbook pages. Um, send us your ideas on the comment box on the right if you can. But um, I want you to also, uh, or I do also want to recognize that it is more complex to uh, present problems such as this, but it will move you in a direction um, that has your students better prepared for the real world than just doing book math worksheets or textbook pages. So um, if you want to contribute to that conversation about the ways that these are different, um, feel free to enter in the comment box. Uh, it looks like uh, oh yes we have some coming oh you do have to type it to me yeah sorry about that that was a reminder type it to me the presenter in the box um, we have we're back to 
to, I'm sorry, I missed one from before from the measuring diagonally. Yep. Um, but anybody who wants to, to contribute to the, um, this portion, feel free. I'm watching a little more carefully here. Um, I don't know where. So this is from the um, NCTM principles and standards for school mathematics. Mathematics makes more sense and it's easier to remember and to apply when students connect new knowledge to existing knowledge in meaningful ways. When students are doing math in ways that make sense and that are applied and that have context, as many um, many of your um, CTE lessons can be. Um, it's a great place to embed math because um, not only for um, for all students, but for students with um, difficulty remembering and memorizing, um, you may really be surprised at the ways that they can excel when uh, mathematics is presented in, in these contexts where they're not just expected to memorize and do procedures, but they're actually um, given real problems to solve. Um, and it, it can be really exciting to, to see those kinds of things, um, to see students blossom in those ways. Um, I just want to go through some resourceful websites um, that you may want to check out. I, obviously, the um, standards, you can look through at corestandards.org and also achieve the core. Org, but there's also some assessment consortia that are important to um, check out um, for how are these how are these skills being assessed? You as teachers really want to be involved in um, or be very aware of these kinds of things. So those are, are good places to poke around um, for some tools and instructional tips. NCTM, you may recognize as the um, authors of, of that one, um, the Principles and Standards document that we talked about. But they also have a website, nctm.org, and they um, have lots and lots of resources, some for purchase, but many free resources um, on instruction and different tools. Um, also, I don't know if you've checked this out before. If not, if this is a really fun site. Your students will love it. You'll love it. It's um, the National Library Virtual Manipulatives. Um, a lot of um, schools don't have all these manipulatives, or a lot of times it's difficult to figure out how to use them. They are, many of them are available in an online format format through this website, and it's really fun. And you can even just play games um, like, you know, um, that mastermind type of game, you know, that are logic and reasoning games. But there's all kinds of measurement games and ways to understand um, numbers in, in all different capacities, decimals, fractions, um, you name it. So that's a great one to go visit. And as far as instructional support, um, you can see there are three different um, websites listed here, um, nyctcenter.org, uh, LeaderEd, has, um, that's a, where the, a lot of the rigor and relevance, a lot of the things um, that we talk about, that, that's a great website, and um, nextnetwork.org. Um, so we have back over in the chat. Um, I want to come back to these. These tasks are relative to the interests of the student or career the student is tracking. Yes. Um, another participant said, in these examples, students are provided the opportunity to A, work collaboratively, exactly, and discuss their understanding with their peers, and B, apply the concepts to real world examples and C, access the concepts in multiple contexts. Excellent, yeah, exactly. Those are um, coming back to the question of advantages over textbooks or, or worksheets. 
So thank you for those participants that um, that sent those in. Um, great. So let's look at. So these are um, these are the websites, and um, I'd like to leave you with this um, reflection for you to think about ways that. Um, these standards, these Common Core State Standards for Mathematical Practice can be, or maybe they already are, integrated into your CTE classes. And here are the standards. Um, if you want to take a couple of minutes and send in um, some ways that maybe you are applying them, or maybe today during the webinar you kind of got some ideas for other ways that you could apply them within your classes. Um, and type those in, and um, I'll try to read those as they come up. And um, and then also, um, if you have questions, you can send those. Um, we may end up addressing them in email, but um, we may be able to get to some of them here today. So, um, what are some ways that that these standards can be integrated into your classes, or maybe you already are, that you could share. You know, it takes a little bit to type, and then. So. All right. I don't see any just yet, but it may be that it does take a few minutes to type um, these. While you're thinking about that, I'm just going to, um, and maybe this will I'm progressing here. I'll bring you back to these verbs. Kind of slight technical problem here. Um, different types of verbs that we talked about in those quadrants that can help you as you are um, writing your lessons and integrating mathematics into your CTE courses and in whatever whatever um, domain that you teach. Um, and you can see these, you know, connect and generate and understand and identify. Um, you'll see some in all different quadrants, but how we really want to push to um, to um, get to those those quadrants where we are applying and um, and generating um, the verbs represent the level at which students should build and demonstrate their mathematical knowledge. Um, your experiences in your math classes, the the experiences that you provide should be full of verbs, full of action. There should be a lot of doing going on in math classes. A lot of discussion. Um, a lot of um, thinking, collaborating, sharing, critiquing, and um, and so I wanted to end on these with these verbs here. So thank you so much for participating in this webinar. Um, if you have questions, please send those. We have a few minutes, just a few minutes here left for um, questions. If you have them. Folks, say we have one participant. I teach heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and students use math to calculate temperature differences, heat loss, and heat gain of a structure, compression ratios, electrical consumption, and cost of use. Great. There's all kinds of really practical 
application. Thank you so much for sharing that one because there, there are so many built-in ways there and so many different types of math that they can um, use and apply. So thank you. Any others that you want to share what you're doing? Or any questions? Okay, well, um, I think that will wrap up our time. Um, my slides are not progressing. Not sure what that's about. But um, at this time, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for the webinar presented by Ginny Lee. As a reminder, today's webinar and PowerPoint slides will be available for viewing and download at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours.